There are seats up front. No one ever wants to sit there, but. So you all can come up and sit. Joan, you all can come, come sit. Yeah, I think you go ahead. And that way we just avoid a step. All right, so welcome everyone. Uh, I'm Anne Marie Slaughter. I'm the president and CEO of New America. Uh, and welcome to uh, how the Trump campaign took the white working class by storm. So we are here uh, to celebrate Joan Williams' new book, uh, which everyone is holding up. <laughs> um, and I will say uh, that uh, this book grew out of a Harvard Business Review article that took the world by storm uh, shortly after the election. And many of us reading it were um, not surprised that Joan Williams had nailed something really important in the national psyche. Many of us, th hold on, <laughs> again, it, th uh, that's where I'm going, uh, many of us, have known Joan for a very long time. Indeed, uh, when I was on my book tour for Unfinished Business, uh, Women, Men, Work, Family, I would often start by saying, look, Joan Williams wrote the Bible in this area. She wrote Unbending Gender in roughly 2000. She completely got the ideal worker, the fetish, the fetish of the ideal worker, how care and the uh, uneven distribution of care was a core part of deep inequality debates. So in the world of women, work, and family, we've been going back to the well for a long time. <laughs> and, uh, and indeed, then uh, Joan and her daughter uh, wrote a book on the, the, the sort of barriers to women in the workplace uh, in, I think, 2013, was that? Did it come out? Uh, no, again, a fabulous book, really nailing specifically the problems uh, that women uh, face. So none of us were surprised, it's just that she was now taking on a different topic. Uh, really, the, the, uh, she takes aim at the astonishment uh, of many people on the left uh, who voted for Hillary Clinton or Bernie Sanders before, uh, at why so many members of the white working class uh, voted for Trump. Uh, and she then, in her article and in this book, the subtitle of the book, it's White Working Class, and the subtitle is Overcoming Class Cluelessness in America, she really explores the anger and the resentment and fundamentally the disconnect uh, of the white working, of white working class voters against progressives and establishment politicians, uh, in many ways against what, at least in Britain, people are calling globalists, uh, people, uh, people from anywhere, people who have achieved identities and are mobile and global uh, in ways that people who are often stuck somewhere in the same place uh, that they grew up uh, are, are not mobile and, and, and see a world uh, they are not part of and a world that they think has left them behind and they're holding people to account for that. So she's here, so I'm not gonna spend any more time telling you uh, her arguments. Uh, Joan is a distinguished professor of law at UC Hastings. Uh, she's a, found, a foundation chair. She's also the founding director of the Center for Work-Life Law, and, and that's, that's not family law and that's not women's law, that is work-life law. She's really pioneered that whole area uh, of law. Uh, and uh, th th she is going to be uh, in uh, uh, conversation, uh, with, I'm gonna go this way, uh, with Cecilia Munoz immediately to my right. Uh, I love this, our own Cecilia Munoz, who is uh, <laughs> now our Vice President for Policy and Technology and our Director of New America's National Network, uh, who uh, spent the last eight years uh, in the Obama administration, the last five of those, as the head of the Domestic Policy Council and encountered many of these different uh, issues. Uh, to her right, uh, again, our own, although she has many other identities, Janelle Ross, uh, who is a reporter for the Washington Post, but a New America National Fellow, and she's writing a book about the racial wealth gap 
uh, and the truth about its real origins, uh, as th those origins laid bare by the Great Recession, uh, and the book will be published by Beacon Press. She is, in her day job, also a political reporter for the Washington Post. Uh, and then to Joan's uh, right, uh, 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 Jenna Johnson, where the Post is well represented, uh, also a political reporter for the Washington Post, and who covers my I don't know what to say, my sympathies, my, uh, she covers the White House, uh, <laughs> and she spent more than a year writing about uh, Donald Trump's presidential campaign, traveled to over 35 states, uh, and attended over 170 political rallies, and interviewed hundreds of Trump supporters. Uh, so we are gonna have a lively conversation, and over to you, thank you. All right, well, we're just gonna jump on in, and I have some questions that came up as I was reading Joan's book, um, but hopefully I won't even get to many of those because we're just gonna have this cozy little discussion that you guys get to listen in on for about 45 minutes, and then we're gonna throw it open to you uh, to take some more questions. Um, so let's, let's go back to election night. Um, Joan, on election night, you were, inspired to write this essay uh, that led to this book. Um, where were you? Who were you with? What was going through your mind as you were watching the results come in? Well, I mean, it was so poignant. I teach at a law school, and the, the women students at the law school had, had um, <clears throat> organized a whole bunch of us in pantsuits that day to celebrate the historic victory of Hillary Clinton. And I actually, and meanwhile, was getting more and more worried. I had been like living at Clinton headquarters in San Francisco. When Trump won, I was amazed, but I was not all surprised. I, I kind of knew he was gonna win. Um, and so I left this election night victory party at uh, about 7.30, because uh, I said like, it's done. Um, I can't even bear this. And I went home to an email from my editor at Harvard Business Review, which published the essay, which now has been read by close to four million people, and then the book. And she said, jo Joan, now you really have to write about the election, because she'd been trying to get me to write uh, based on what works for women at work, and I was going like, the gender dynamic in this election is so obvious, it's not even interesting to write about. Um, but she said, Joan, you're the person who focuses on gender and class, you're the right person. So I stayed up till one o'clock one, one in the morning <coughs> writing this essay. And I said a lot of things that are controversial. Um, and my attitude was I've been reining myself in. I know this, a lot of this stuff is not gonna be popular, but I'm done. We are really up a creek. Um, and we're up a creek not only because of Trump, and then I'll let you get a word in edgewise, but Trump ain't the half of it, folks. I mean. The, there are only 16 Democratic governors. Um, there are uh, two-thirds of partisan state legislatures are held by, uh, by re Republicans. And we just went through eight years of a president who I very deeply admired, who I say with great admiration and respect, accomplished very little that is gonna be lasting because we didn't hold the House. Why, why are we doing this? The Democrats have what I call a blue coasts and blue dot strategy with an ocean of red in between. That's what's really going on, and that's why um, I wrote this book. And was there anything, after you wrote that initial essay, you heard from hundreds of people who were leaving comments and reaching out to you. Between writing that essay and writing this book, um, did you happen to learn anything new, or were there issues that you ended up bringing up in this book that, that you hadn't quite thought through until you started kind of crowdsourcing this issue? Well, I mean, I've, I've, uh, the, the HBR article now, last time I looked, which is several months ago, had like over 800 comments, and I personally received 200 personal letters. Um, I hear from people all the time. There are a number of different groups, and now I've been, I'm on book tour, so I've been talking to reporters nonstop. And there's several different, very different reactions to the book. Um, from the most positive reaction is typically from people I call class migrants, people who were brought up in blue collar 
families and now are in the professional elites. And class migrants go like, finally someone is saying this. Finally someone is describing what's going on that's driving American politics. They tend to absolutely love this book. Um, the group that likes it least are, um, you know, my people out in San Francisco. <laughs> There was just a, um, a, an interview, I've forgotten whether it was Slate or Salon, tells you how uncool I am, but <laughs> uh, that where the, I mean, the, the ne most negative reaction is why are you coddling these racists, white lady? Why are you coddling these racists? So we're, we're going to jump into that question uh, in depth in a little bit here, but I want to, Chanel, where, where were you election night? What, what were you doing? What were you thinking? I, of course, I'm going to have to censor part of the answer okay. to that question <laughs> <laughs> so I can remain employed. I feel like my, um, I was at home on election night. I worked during the day. I was at home on election night and like you, probably about 7.30, 7.45, it was pretty clear to me what was happening. I was not like you um, expecting that outcome in any way, shape, or form, so I was completely shocked. Um, and really, on a personal level, somewhat, um, I think the election did a couple of things. You know, I think I, it really raised some, some very troubling questions for me about what it is that animates our politics, really, like, really provides the fuel. Like, what is really driving this country and the decisions that people are making? And then I think secondarily, um, what it is that people don't care about at all that, again, on a personal level, are things that are absolutely critical for my health, welfare, and well-being. So I was pretty troubled, I think, in that sense. You know, professionally, it was also alarming in that it was very clear that we had very much misunderstood this election. Or at least I did. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> working in the Obama administration at the time. Um, uh, I wasn't expecting this outcome, but I was nervous enough that I was home by myself with a bottle of whiskey. <laughs> um, and got an email at about midnight from the chief of staff basically saying, let's all get on the phone. And we all got on the phone at 12.05, the senior team. And he basically said, look, we all can see where this is going. I need you all to get some sleep because we start the transition tomorrow. So please, I know what you're going through. I'm going through it too. Go to bed. You have to get some rest because this is what we're doing tomorrow. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll share my, my election night story also. Uh, I covered Trump for um, <coughs> since September 2015 on the campaign trail. Um, but on election night, I actually opted to not be at his party. Um, I wanted to be out in the country with Trump supporters. And to me, they were always the most interesting part of covering Trump, was just this political movement that he sparked um, that totally took everyone by surprise. So I was in Latrobe, Pennsylvania, right outside of Pittsburgh, um, and there's a thing there called the Trump House, which is this woman who's a uh, landlord in the area, has this farmhouse on a highway that she painted like an American flag and put a big Donald Trump in the front yard. And people literally would go to the polls and then kind of make pilgrimages to the Trump house to take photos outside and, and to talk to each other. And unlike in a lot of places in the country, especially DC or New York where a lot of my coworkers that were that day, you could feel this building energy and this building excitement. And sure, I was in Trump country, um, but even when I was at the polls talking to people who didn't vote for Trump, uh, they weren't voting for Clinton either. Um, and uh, I talked to one guy who was just up in arms that, that Trump was promising to bring back steel jobs, saying, it's never going to happen. How dare he lie to people? And I asked him, well, who did you vote for? And he said, well, I wrote in myself, because I could do better than anyone at this. <laughs> and, um, and so as the election results came in, I mean, I remember that moment when he won Florida. And everyone around me was like, oh my gosh, he might actually be able to do this. Um, and I was with very strong Trump supporters, and they were surprised. And they wouldn't let themselves believe it, because they really, they felt like they just had gotten screwed over so many times 
and that something was going to happen and that this was going to get yanked away from them also. Um, so a photographer and I were at this bar called Sharkies, uh, watching the results come in and, and talking with people. And you know, there's this one guy sitting at the bar, an auto, a guy who had been laid off and um, from an auto company, and he was saying, you know, maybe I'm going to stop drinking. Maybe I'm going to like lose some weight. Maybe I'm, and just like in this bar, as this historic thing was happening, there was a sense of hope there. Um, and people can debate if that's, um, if there's any depth to that hope or not. Um, but for them, they felt like they had finally won something um, after always kind of being the loose losers on, on these sorts of things. Um, so Jill, walk us through, um, your, your book's called Working White, White Working Class. Um, in the book, you talk about elites. You talk a little bit about, you mentioned the middle class. Um, what, what do these terms mean? Like when we're talking about the working class, who, who are these people? Well, I mean, in the United States, we literally lack a language to talk about class. So I use the language that Heather Boucher of the Washington Center for Equitable Growth and I developed for a report called The Three Faces of Work Family Conflict, where we defined low income as the bottom 30% of American households and the elite as the pop, top 25, uh, 15 to 20% of American households. And then in the middle, I call them the missing middle after Theda Scotchbold, because they're so often missing in policy discussions, Theda Scotchbold pointed out. Um, so they're actually the middle class, and I wanted to call this book about the middle class because it is. It's about the middle class. But my editors said that would be very confusing because the lawyers making $200,000 a year are deluded that they're middle class. By the way, that's top 6%, just so you know. Um, they call themselves upper middle class. And so um, the, it's really confusing because people in the middle class call themselves middle class. They call the likes of us rich. Um, but where I grew up, we call these people working class or lower middle class. And there are also racial differences in understandings of class. And then the working class term, which is generally what the elite refers to as the middle, now progressives generally use as a euphemism to, for the poor in a very elegant way, completely erasing this group from American political discourse. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to actually read a couple paragraphs that are only three pages into your book mm -hmm. um, that I feel like really get to kind of the heart of the tension that you explore in this book and might also kind of rub some of your San Francisco neighbors the wrong way. Um, but it, it says, during an era when wealthy white Americans have learned to sympathetically imagine the lives of the poor, people of color, and LGBTQ people, the white working class have been insulted or ignored during precisely the period when their economic fortunes tanked. The typical white working class household income doubled in the three decades after World War II but has not risen appreciably since. The death rate for white working class men and women aged 45 to 54 increased substantially between 1993 and 2013, a reversal from the decades before. In 1970, only a quarter of white children lived in neighborhoods with poverty rates of 10%. By 2000, 40% did. And in an era when the economic fortunes of the white working class plummeted, elites wrote off their anger as racism, sexism, nativism, beneath our dignity to take seriously. This has led us to politics polarized by working class fury. And so the pushback to that <laughs> is that Donald Trump ran a campaign that he proudly called politically incorrect. And he said things that have been labeled as sexist, as racist, as insensitive, as offensive. Um, I went to dozens of rallies. Uh, I saw Confederate flags. I saw white Trump supporters yelling really terrible things at, at black and Latino protesters. Um, I saw people wearing t-shirts that said, Trump that bitch. Um, and so, how do we, how do we kind of balance needing to have this empathy for the working white, the white working class at a time when they need it, with the fact that some of these people don't seem to have much empathy for people who are not, who are different than them? 
Yeah, I mean, I think it's important to say, is there racism among the white working class? Yes, a glorious tradition of it. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, um, one, of the, one of the things I've been focused on in the last 10 years is racism among the professional elite. And as you know, if you, the most famous study is the, what I call the Greg Jamal study, where Jamal has to have eight additional years of experience as compared to Greg to get the same number of callbacks. So I think we should call out racism when we see it. I think racism is a very pervasive. But what I really think is unhelpful is to have a white elite looking down at non-elite whites and saying, I'm completely uninterested in your economic plummet because you, that other group of whites, is racist. That strikes me as snobism and the refusal to acknowledge class privilege. Um, I also think it's important not to conflate Trump with all Trump voters. Not a Trump fan is our Joan. Not a Trump fan. Not a Trump fan. I mean, that's why I'm out here taking these positions. This is like really shocking what we have. Um, and uh, I mean, of course, just a side diversion. What the Democratic campaign should have done is trotted out a never-ending series of those blue-collar tradesmen who um, Donald Trump screwed, right? They should have been at every single rally, but moving on to ancient history. Um, so I think it's really important um, that to, to say that not all of Trump voters are like Trump. You've met them. A lot of them are decent people. Most of them are angry people. They feel like they're the forgotten people. That doesn't mean they're the only forgotten people. They're not. That doesn't mean that they're not the recipients of white privilege. They are. For those two generations after World War II, when they had access to good middle class jobs and good housing, African Americans didn't have the same access. That's the white privilege. But isn't the answer that all hardworking Americans are, should be entitled to good housing and good jobs, not that none of them are? Cecilia, step in. Yeah. Uh, I, Mel and I are exchanging glances, and you can tell we're both dying to get into the race question, and I, I am too. But, but before, um, before we fully dive in, I think there is a, a, an additional layer of pushback that I feel super compelled to say. I, I agree with your premise that we haven't had enough of a conversation and that elites and this includes policymaking elites, that there's a lot that they, that they or we don't understand or, or have chosen not to understand or refuse to understand. But so in general, I think it's a really, it's, a, it's an important book, it's a helpful book, it's an important conversation to be having. I have to say though, um, as somebody who's sort of fresh out of the Obama administration, that, that while I think the critique is fair, I also think there are ways in which it's not fair with respect to policy making and what the administration was trying to do. I think we can be faulted perhaps for not breaking through on, on a lot of questions and a lot of the policy that we put forward and certainly we didn't succeed in getting pre-K for all and we, while we succeeded with the Affordable Care Act, obviously that's still very much in question. Um, but I will say that, and just to use an example, a tiny example from my colleague, his name, a former colleague, his name is David Seamus. He was the, essentially, effectively the political director in the second term and had a communications role in the first term. Walked around every day with the cover of his binder, we all had binders, um, was a graph from the polling that he was doing um, about what was happening to this very group of people that you're describing economically <laughs> and with a quote that he picked up from a focus group which was, I feel like I'm working harder and I just keep falling further behind. And that was his animating statement for every day and he like would show it to everybody else to make sure it was our animating statement. But more importantly, we got constant reinforcement of that from the president himself who, what, you know, he got his famous 10 letters a night that he would read, and we would regularly get a copy of a letter from a nurse or from a white working class dude who would say, I didn't vote for you, but here's what I'm worried about. And invariably it would say, these are the people that we're working for. Um, he didn't want us to forget because it was an animating principle for him and it was as a policymaker in that administration, 
uh, I know it was, it was animating for us and what we were trying to accomplish. And we can have, and we probably, we certainly shouldn't have today, a conversation about you know, how well or terribly we succeeded in that effort. But I will say that, that it's reasonable to push back on whether or not this is a subject of policy making, because at least in my experience it is. Um, it is not, and, and I, I agree that there is also a bubble, that there is a lot that we don't understand. As important as the race question is, and I, I was in, I've been in the civil rights movement my whole life, so I, for, to me, it's tremendously important. I also think it, 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 we run the risk of it also obscuring um, what you just said, which is that there are commonalities across race of what the economic trends for the last many decades have meant. To, and it turns out that while there are important differences that you just described, there are important similarities between communities of color that have been taking it in the chin economically for a really long time and the community that you describe. And your book doesn't do this, but there, the conversation frequently does, suggests that we got to choose, that we, are, that we are somehow encouraging people to think about African Americans and Latinos, um, and that they, they should be the subject of policy making because of historic and current discrimination, and that that must come at the expense of working class whites, or, or we should switch from one to the other, and that, I think, is an enormous mistake. Um, and I, if, you're not making it in the book, but the conversation that tends to swirl around this question frequently goes there, and it's something we should resist. Can I make one comment? Yeah, and then I go for it. your turn. But here's the epigram for the book. It's from Martin Luther King. Equality means dignity, and dignity mean, demands a, a job and a paycheck that lasts through the week. That is an agenda that it, uh, would t totally appeal to the white working class, absolutely at the front and center, and the working class of color and low-income people. A, jo a job with a paycheck that lasts through the week, that's where the Democrats should be. I want to, I guess, maybe add a few things. I, I am going to join in um, expressing absolute interest and agreement in um, what I think you describe very eloquently in this book, which is a real uh, disregard for the um, tremendous sort of economic suffering and decline that a number of people in this country have experienced, in particular uh, white working class people um, in the middle of the country, in the South. Without question, those things are real. Um, and certainly, I, I would also agree that it probably is unwise to um, make assumptions about every Trump voter's sort of total character portrait. But I, I guess I'm going to say this. One, I think that we would probably collectively as a country, but certainly in our politics, do well to let go of the idea that if a person is racist, they are nothing else or if a person is motivated or animated by racist ideas, that they are nothing else. There are plenty of people who, uh, to borrow a phrase that M. Marie used, you know, they have multiple identities, quite frankly. They are teachers, they are parents, they are racists. They are many things. Um, and the reality is, ooh, I'm sorry, the reality is that our, um, you can say this about Trump voters. There are two groups, at least distinctly, in that wheelhouse. One group is a group that has suffered tremendously economically, and it has operated since at least the 1950s, but frankly, at least the 1960s, moving forward into the present in such a way that they have allowed themselves to be regularly and predictably manipulated by racist appeals. And that was the engine of the Trump campaign and getting people so wound up and excited. The other half of the Trump voter sort of pool may or may not suffer that sort of economic fate, but certainly decided at the end of the day that those elements of the Trump campaign were not so repugnant that they could not cast a vote for him um, or what they believed that he would do. So those things have to be acknowledged, I believe, very firmly. Secondly, I think they have to be acknowledged because how can you then begin to figure out, one, how do you sort of politically market policies to people who anytime they hear anything about jobs, about looking after people's sort of health, overall welfare, well-being, 
immediately what those things signal in their minds are that one, lazy people that they look down on um, are somehow going to get more than them or get over on them, even though the data and reality does not support any of those ideas. And then two, therefore I don't want to hear anything about it, but I am, if I am that voter and I am that person who is animated by that kind of racist thinking, then you are going to be open to uh, the alternative proposals. You know, let's uh, get rid of quote unquote socialized medicine and let's take it back to the market. This is where we will all thrive, even though we know exactly what the healthcare coverage rates were like before, right? Like we know those things. So I think we have to face the really ugly, like really complicated truth in order to really begin to um, one, acknowledge people's very real economic suffering, but two, then figure out real solutions that don't involve simply blaming people. You know, one thing that you brought up, um, which we've actually talked about in, in the newsroom before, is just a lack of understanding about what the government does. Um, Joan, in your book, you actually um, quoted this 2008 survey where they asked Americans if they've ever used a government social program or not. Mm -hmm. And 56.5% said they had never used a government social program, when in fact, 91.6% had. Um, this includes disability, the mortgage interest deduction, student loans, tax exemptions, um, and then these entitlement programs that get all of the attention, um, health care, food stamps, um, housing assistance, um, and I actually found, I uh, couldn't <coughs> believe, almost every rally I went to as I was going around and, and talking with Trump supporters, um, time after time I would find people who would say that num one of the biggest things they wanted Trump to change as president is the entitlement programs. That they felt like there are a lot of lazy people out there who are getting help that they're not getting, that um, immigrants, that refugees, that everyone's getting help except for them, you know? And then I would ask, well, what, what do you do for a living? Um, and they were on disability, you know? They had been hurt in the job and were on disability. And so I would ask, well, are you worried about that getting cut also? I mean, that's also an entitlement program. And they weren't because there was a feeling that they had earned it, that they had worked, that they had paid into the system, and that this that they fell on a hard time and, and that they earned what they were now getting. Um, so let's talk a little bit just about this, this huge disconnect here. Joan, why don't you start? Well, um, first of all, I actually, um, one thing I want to say is I don't blame Obama for any of this. I think Obama came from a white middle class family, right? Uh, he understood this. He totally got this. Bill Clinton gets it you know, equally. I, I blame Democrats for not being able to hold the House so that you guys couldn't get done what you should have been able to get done. That's who I blame. I blame me, uh, not you. But it's an interesting question that Democrats haven't been able to make stick, that the two longest periods of, like, the point you made was how come Democrats aren't owning the jobs issue. The two longest streaks of job growth in our recent economic history were under President Obama and President Clinton. So, but you're right that that's not understood. Well, but actually, that's it. Kind of is. That's my point. It's a message. I mean, it's it's a messaging. I mean, and it's like I was just up on the hill, and I was saying they were saying like, well, we talk about jobs all the time, and I'm going, yeah, it's item 17 and a 19, you know, and, and a 357 um, item list. Uh, and whereas Trump comes and says. You are the forgotten people. I am listening to you. I hear you want jobs. I'm going to get you jobs. Now, it's a lie, but um, he, he, they feel like, oh, he hears me. Um, so to answer your question, means so I, I think, just, let's, let's yeah. Let's stay on that for a minute. So what, I mean, what, what could Democrats be doing to own this issue more? I mean, is it just messaging, or are there actual things that, that, that yeah. they should be doing. I mean, most of my messages for Democrats are um, messaging issues, like climate change. I think the way we message climate change is a recipe for class conflict and is corroded support for environmental issues globally. But I think that when it comes to the jobs issue, I think we have to say, 
I was, again, I was on the Hill and somebody was saying, you know, the only thing that this whole broad coalition of us agree on is um, jobs. And I'm going like, you know, from your mouth to God's ears. Um, I, I do think that we should make a very concrete proposal and say, and this is based on a really wonderful book, everybody should read, it's called America's Moment Re by Rework America. It's out of the Marco Foundation. What we need is a new education to employment system. The, ed the college for all did not work. Two thirds of Americans are not college grads. We need to be talking about good jobs for people who are not college grads. The Democrats are often seen as the, the, the party of college grads. We totally got, uh, so what we need is uh, an alliance. And you know, the Obama administration did some of this. But again, you guys didn't have the Congress. Um, you, the alliances where community colleges get together with businesses. I mean, you can say this, you guys did it. We just, that needs to be, well, tell them what it is. Well, so it's a combination of things. One part is um, updating high school to make sure it's engaging and project-based, and my colleague, um, Christina, is nodding her head because she's an education specialist and fellow with us. But that actually pro uh, project-based learning, hands-on learning, the kind of learning that helps you see how you're going to be applying what you're learning in the real world needs to start much earlier, it needs to happen earlier, and particularly in high school. This is an, an effort that we spent a lot of time on without of help, a lot of help from the Congress, but with a lot of help, local help, because there are local business leaders and local <laughs> school districts who, who understand that. This notion that some level of higher education is going to be necessary in order to be successful. This is when President Obama put forward the free community college proposal. It was aimed very specifically, not just at 18-year-olds, but also made, uh, would be made available to adults. If it's $15 an hour, it doesn't matter. The, but the, right, but the, what the, job, the kinds of jobs that we're talking about are not $15 an hour jobs. Yeah. Again, that's the whole yeah. point, that we spent at least as much time talking about making sure people had preparation to become welders, that's right. uh, which are good middle class jobs, as making sure that they have access to higher education. Now, again, I think some of this is a messaging problem, that, but that it's not for a lack of policy focus or policy ideas. But um, we are in a situation where, um, and I, I, I had some sympathy for the campaign in trying to do this. Um, and look, I'm a policy wonk. This is what I do, right? You can put forward the ideas. It requires explanation for how you're going to make it happen. If you're thoughtful about it and if you mean it, you have to talk about how you're going to make it happen and how you're going to pay for it. Um, that's what makes policy proposals real. It's really easy to get up there and say, don't worry, you're all going to have a job. But unless you have the wonky, nerdy details for how it happens and how you pay for it, it's not true. And the Wonky, th communicating the wonky nerdy details turns out to be devilishly difficult. Well, sorry. it seems to me there are also sort of two things here. One is, um, I used to live in a southern state, which I'm not going to name because I don't want to, I guess, pick on this place or pick on a, a particular company. But I used to live in a southern state where mm -hmm. the single largest employer in the state was a humongous big box retailer that exist everywhere that you can probably guess who that is. <laughs> and as a result, you can imagine that the average household income and uh, all of the things that go along with that were shaped by that. So while I, I certainly, um, you know, who can argue with the logic of we'll have to be much more thoughtful about what sorts of preparation that people need for um, the jobs that will exist in the future, um, you know, who can argue with that? It's quite logical, right? Um, although people did. Um, you know, look what has become of the debate about Common Core. Um, and then again, um, and what was that debate? It was, in essence, that this is a way to inculcate our children with liberal ideas, right? So let's think about that. Again, I would say you have to be honest about what is animating people's thinking and therefore how they act and behave politically. But I would also say that we're probably going to have to have a much more detailed, nuanced, um, and probably difficult conversation about the jobs that do exist right now in communities around this country, why so many people are paid so poorly, have no benefits, you know, have, don't even have sick days. You know, we have to have that conversation because that's also 
about the here and now. And until you begin to talk to those people and make them feel that their um, struggles are not only understood and real and something that the government is trying to respond to, you leave them at minimum vulnerable to a really skillful political effort to convince them that a very simple proposal, I'm just going to bring these jobs back, um, can work for them. So I, I, I guess my <laughs> larger point is that I don't think that, I guess I don't think that most people are upset because they don't, well, I'll leave it at that. Let me stop there because I've gone on. Yeah. I mean, I, I really admire what the Obama administration did in this regard, but I'm proposing something maybe a little bit different, which is that the, the government go to em local employers and say, let's help you invent the new generation of blue collar jobs. Um, let's help you figure out, in alliance with Silicon Valley, how to upskill not only blue collar jobs, which by the way, require technical training now, but also pink collar jobs and minimum wage jobs. And I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, one is that we should have going to employers and saying, here, what are the specific skills you need in your workforce? Because there's a documented lack of Americans trained for middle skill jobs. Why? As someone who's been a university professor since he was 28 years old, we have focused on college too much. Very important, not the only thing. Um, and so we should, we, we should go to employers, say, here are the skills that you need, develop, work with a community college, and say, we're going to develop a certificate program, not a four-year degree, but a certificate program with family-friendly hours, Anne-Marie, because these people are going to have families, um, that's much shorter, that will provide a certificate where the employer will hire you because he has confidence in the certificate. And we should metric these programs not on people trained, but on people placed. That's what we need. And that's not true only for blue collar. It's also true for minimum wage. Again, this, this America's Moment book is very important. And one of the things that it, it talks about is what's called the tablet pilot. And they gave um, home health care aides, typically low-income women of color, paid crap pardon my language, and um, they gave them tablets with 15 healthcare screening questions that they filled in, and um, it improved healthcare outcomes because the information got to the doctors much quicker. They decreased healthcare costs, same reason, and if handled correctly, um, they could pay those gals more because they're upskilling those jobs. That is the model. We are not neoliberal. This is the result of this economy where there's great knowledge jobs and crap minimum wage jobs. That's the result of economic policy, industrial policy, not the inevitable result of globalization. If you think it's inevitable, I have one word for you, and that word is Germany. The last time you bought a pair of scissors, they were made by a middle skilled job being paid a family wage in Germany. Why not here? Um, I, if you want me to answer, I can answer the means-tested program thing, or do you want to go on? I know sure, we're at the end of it. Sure, go for it. Um, you know, and I know this is one of the very controversial things I say. I know it's controversial. Um, I think means-tested programs are a recipe for class conflict, and I think they're one of these things that plays into the hands of Republicans and has served massively to discredit government in all its functions. Um, and the reason is, I mean, partly it's racism. We know that reason, right? And that's there. But that's not all that's there. Partly, I tell the story in the book of my sister-in-law, who was at the time working as a Head Start teacher in Waterbury, Connecticut. And she was paid $12,000 a year to provide free childcare for um, people in Head Start. She told me the story one time, she was absolutely livid, where um, so, um, one of the moms was late picking up the kids. And she had to pay not only for childcare, she had to pay a dollar a minute when she was late for her childcare. So this woman who was not paying for childcare was late, which was of course free to her, and she showed up with a bag from Macy's. And this made my sister-in-law absolutely go ballistic. Now, I understand what's going on. I've studied poverty for a long time. 
There's an amazing article about why sometimes people with very modest incomes buy a particular um, uh, consumer item and how important that is to them. I do not judge the woman who showed up. But I, I understand why she was angry. And I think that's what means-tested programs do. I'm not saying we shouldn't have any means-tested programs. I'm not saying we shouldn't support the poor. I am not saying that. I am saying that the recipe for us as Democrats is universal programs. And look at Obamacare. Obama, and you know I admire him, but bless his heart, if I, all he ever did was talk about the 20 million people who were uninsured. So he messaged this program as a program targeted to the poor. And I'm going, Barack, how about the middle class? Well, why might Obamacare be saved? It's because of the universal program. It's because of, you can keep your kids on their insurance till they're 26. It's because of the pre-existing condition. Those are universal programs. Look, they are so sticky, not even the Republicans who own everything can get rid of them. Let's just listen to that message. I think we're, <laughs> and on that note, so, Cecilia, well, so you yeah. saw me exchange smiles with my Orange and current uh, colleague, Tara McGinnis, who worked on healthcare policy in the administration, among many other things. And the reason we were smiling is because it's so enormously frustrating that people heard a part of the president's message and not the rest of the message, where, which you know, we were involved in helping communicate, in particular about the tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people who, that had healthcare that got protections as a result of the law that we feel like we talked about till we were blue in the face, but could, but for some reason, it's not what people heard, um, right? So the notion, the, the, pre, the protections, if you have a pre-existing condition, the access to preventive care without having co-pays or co-insurance, all of these features of, of Obamacare, all of which benefit everybody who has health care, including the people who had it before the law was passed. But that is, it's not where the conversation ends up, which is why, which is why we have this discussion. I, I, I want to just add, if I can. Maybe two things. One, I while I, I you know can imagine if I were your sister-in-law that I would be really upset also about that Macy's bag. I, I would say that there does come a point for our country and its welfare where you have to say that my personal irritation with a woman in her Macy's bag is not a basis for policy making. Like it's not, and if that does become the basis for policy making, instead of saying to yourself. How can we as a country realize or maximize what we get for our public investments? Or how can we make sure that those who have the least have some sort of minimal standard, like say, access to preventative care? You know, like if, if you step away from that conversation, it's almost a concession to the idea that a kind of, um, angry at minimum, maybe even nasty um, undercurrent in politics is not only acceptable, but the right way to move like through the world. And that is very, very troubling to me. I guess that is what comes to mind for me when I think about the idea that in order to sell things that they have to be universal. I, I understand the logic, but it does it underscores the point that you made earlier, which is that we do have this notion, there's this sort of collective notion that other people are getting over in a way that I'm not, and those other people are probably black or brown. Right. And that that is ab an absolute undercurrent, and the conversation that we don't have, or that we don't succeed in breaking through with, is what the realities are of that situation, one. But two, also that it's this isn't just about altruism, that it's also that, like, the, our collective future yeah. is better if that kid is in that Head Start program, right? That, that this is not something that is done by some of us for others of us that are isolated. That these are investments that we make which actually affect us collectively. But also that this is becoming majority in our country. So and there's a pretty good idea. As we are flippant people. and dismissive about or angry about some people and the very existence of their needs, those people also come to define our country and its actual sort of state of affairs. 
um, and the longer that we remain a country where people are being actively manipulated and animated politically by the idea that some people should be at the bottom, the longer that we put ourselves in a position where we're actually quite weak, sort of in a broad way, which is the other thing I was going to say earlier, and I stopped myself, which is I don't actually believe that all of Trump's voters are upset about perhaps having to work at a big box store, but rather that they now have the same jobs as people that they view as beneath them. That's what I think is happening. All right, okay, one more thought. Very, very Questions. quickly, yeah. I don't think this is just an anecdote. Um, I, there is you know, 30 years of sociology that says that these means-tested programs have really soured the attitude towards the government. Um, and I, I also don't think we should abandon the poor. I mean, I live in San Francisco where I, you know, I'm among God's forgotten every single day, and I feel shame that we're not, that, that that's the kind of society that we live in. I do think we should understand that those kinds of programs produce class conflict, and we should try to control for it, and we should go universal wherever we can. All right, you guys ready for some questions? Yeah. Oh, very eager. All right, the woman in the front row here. What happens when you consider just what you said at the beginning? Most of the governorships, the state government, um, how are we going to get elections to turn it things around, gerrymandering. I don't know how we're going to um, remove the Republicans. It's more than engagement, right? That that's, look, the, the answer is engagement. The, the, we own this democracy, and if there is, you know, I am a person who, who my glass is always half full. That's been a little harder in the last several months for me. But I do think that, I, you know, I listen to my children describe the results of the election. I have adult daughters. And they are thinking about democracy and the institutions of our democracy in a way that they hadn't before. And I, I, I see this a lot. That, and you see it in action around the country through groups like Indivisible and others, that people are engaging in questions of gerrymand gerrymandering, in engaging their state legislatures, and engaging um, congressional races. Because I think there was this sense of we sort of took the institutions of our democracy for granted. Um, and. A lot of people aren't doing that anymore. So, so these are not intractable problems. We own the solutions to those problems if we show up. I mean, my hunch is that we can't. I mean, I'm I'm live in a state that either is min, uh, majority minority or very very soon will be. But I think it. You know, with great respect, I think it's comfort food for us to look at that and go like we just have to wait until you know what I mean. I'm not going to say it in public, but it's said all the time in private. Um, no wonder these people are angry at us, by the way. But anyway, um, that great ocean of red, that's not going to go majority minority anytime soon. And the gerrymandering comes from the absolute command in that ocean of red of Republicans. The only way we're going to get anything done in Washington, much less outside it, is by talking again to the white working class. And I'm doing that now because I think that's the best thing we can do is repair this relationship with this group, not only for people of color, but also for women, LGBT, LGBTQ, immigrants, you name it. <coughs> I, if I can just add a counterpoint. I feel like I probably talk about this book way too much, like I should receive pay for this, but <laughs> there is a book called Brown is the New White that was um, published last year that I, I really find fascinating in that. In essence, what he does is sort of challenge the orthodoxy of this idea that the Democratic Party absolutely has to reclaim white voters, white working class voters. That fundamentally, <laughs> if the party were to fully animate the voters that it can count on right now, which is largely um, a sliver of uh, more educated white voters, and basically all of your active voters of color, that you could, if you can animate those people to show up for midterm elections, then you can begin to address the issues like makeup of legislatures, et cetera, 
deal with issues like gerrymandering and exactly what election districts look like, et cetera, et cetera. And there are, of course, some initiatives on that front, whether or not they'll be successful. I and mean, the Attorney General, um, Eric Holder, is operating one of them, is a question. But I guess I would just say, this is where I think a lot of the frustration comes from with the idea that if that liberals, in particular, the Clinton campaign made a fundamental error in engaging in such overt identity politics and putting questions about race and gender and equality front and center because that fundamentally turns off the white working class voter. Mm -hmm. That may be true. I wouldn't dispute that, but I would dispute whether or not we should sort of lean into, or whether people should be leaning into that or frankly say, well, if that's who you are and where you want to be politically, so be it and move on. A minute or two. Uh, one, I want to salute the New America Foundation for going into this. I've read your book. Um, I was uh, general counsel of the Senate Banking Committee. I was on the Banking Committee for 15 years, so I know the politics, working for the Democrats. I was an assistant secretary for trade under President Clinton. I was 10 years on the China Commission, which is a think tank for the Congress on China. And I think. Um, in your book, you say on page 41, the decline in marriage is a symptom of the working class economic decline, not the reason for it. I think you've got it exactly right. And the other, you show that working class women by 28 percentage points voted for Trump over Hillary. White working class women voted for Trump. So here, I think an important part of what has happened here and that needs to be focused on is when we move from stakeholder to shareholder capitalism, yep. which is described in this new book, The Golden Passport, about the Harvard Business School. And there are two key chapters in there that describe this phenomenon. I was on the banking committee, and I saw it happening. And then, so the corporations, their interests have diverged from the national interest. They can make their CEOs and their shareholders wealthy by outsourcing jobs and and, and, and impoverishing communities and destroying families, but it's good for the shareholders and these guys and the wealthy people made wealthy by this have captured both political parties. There's a book called Listen Liberal, which they explain all this. And Stan Greenberg has written a terrific article in the American Prospect about this whole phenomenon. So it's really, it's not identity politics, we need to talk about class politics and what is happening in this country and how we're impoverishing and, and, and screwing our own people. Trump at least said this is an important issue and the Democrats didn't because we're so beholding to the money classes to finance our campaigns. So campaign finance reform has to be a key part of what we're, how we're gonna change this system so that our country is working for more Americans. I, I don't know what you guys think of that, but I I, I've thought about this a long time. About, I don't disagree about the, with that as a goal at all. Um, I do think, though, that th that w it's important, as important as the, the point Janelle just made is as well, it's important also to look at this, this has to be about more than, than those, you know, so I'm progressive, I'm a Democrat, I worked in Democratic administration, but this has to be about more than elbowing the other folks out of the way. Mm -hmm to make sure that we get hold of the, of the uh, elected institutions of the democracy. It has to be about engaging in the conversation because ultimately there is commonality of purpose among different groups of people who have been taking it on the chin economically. And we, have, we, we are um, moving away from each other at a point when, at, at which if we can actually engage uh, around those commonalities, we can get much further as a society and not have 49, 51 elections all the time. So first of all, um, these are the conversations we need to have. They're hard. They're really hard, and, but we have to have them. But uh, So Janelle, there are two things you said that really troubled me. One was, which is as it should be, frankly, I mean, if we're going to have a real conversation. But one was when you said 
people aren't up, white working class people aren't upset because they're working at Walmart. They're upset because jobs at Walmart are beneath them, meaning they're for people of color. I truly hope that's, I'm, I'm hearing you. I'm truly hoping that's not true. That is not my perception. My perception is they've got really shitty jobs, excuse me, uh, and that's the problem. I do understand, as a Southerner, that for a very long time, poor Southerners were manipulated by wealthy Southerners to think, well, I may be poor, but at least I'm above African Americans. <laughs> that's not the words they use. But if so, so A, I hope that's not true. B, if it is true, it is also the result of deliberate manipulation, uh, which I think has to be recognized because otherwise it is a, these are simply bad and racist people, full stop. But so, first point. But the second, and this one really, I think, gets to the heart of this. If you were a white woman and you said, well, you know, we just need to wait because those people of color, we're going to outnumber them, I wouldn't want to get anywhere near you. I mean, I would never want to be part of a party that said that. And similarly, even if it's true that, and I don't know that it's true across the country, but even if it's true that we're going to become majority minority, something that I think is fantastic as part of the country I love, if that means excluding people who are in the same economic situation as many of those people are today because they're white, then I don't want to be a part of that party either. So I think the part about identity politics is not, and I'm a woman, I've benefited from those politics. But surely there has to be something more. I can't celebrate a country that is only a set of groups that have power. I, I cannot stand up for that country because that same ideology is the ideology that stands up for Aryans or for uh, Christians or for God knows what. It has to be an ideology that stands up for all human beings similarly situated. So I, I, I just want to, I think that is part of the discourse. We just need to wait, but that's not a party I want to be part of. I want to respond to a couple of things. First, I would never, you will never, ever, ever hear me suggest that we shouldn't have great compassion and concern for human beings, whoever they are. I would say that I do take real issue with the idea of comparing the identity politics of people who have seen their lives, their livelihoods, where they live, where they go to school, how much schooling they get, how much health care they get, how much pain medication they get to this day and compare a politics built around concern for those things to Aryanism. Those things are not equivalent and it's troubling to me that <laughs> in these discussions that there would be uh, any kind of movement towards um, comparing those things, but more importantly, assuming that in people forming their politics around the needs that are very much connected to who they are, that they are fundamentally engaging in some kind of sinister practice. Second, the reality is that in 2042, which is not that far away, this in fact will be a minority majority country. That doesn't mean that no one else matters, of course it does. And if I said that, then it would make no sense for me to have said many of the things that I've said before this moment. Clearly, every person matters. What I am suggesting is that, one, there does have to be a real recognition that the fate of people of color in this country truly shapes the fate of the country moving forward. Those are mathematical realities. Those are certainties. And two, that the desires of the white working class voter who has consistently, and this is the thing that Trump probably gets both too much blame and too much credit for, white working class voters and frankly white voters have consistently as a group voted in their own ways around identity concerns, those concerns being precisely the things that you were describing, but at least in part, those things have long animated our politics. What Trump did, perhaps, that was a little differently is be much more overt about that, give it a different label, you know, let's be intentionally politically incorrect. But those things have been part of our politics, certainly, you know, since the... 
Well, certainly, and their sense of what they merit and what they, not only what they merit, but what they are entitled to <laughs> as a group of white people in America. Um, the reality is, of course would it be healthier if we had a politics that said, as an American you are entitled to, as an American who works you are entitled to a reasonable wage that is going to allow you to provide for your family. You are entitled to reasonable health care that is going to allow you to go to that job or to send your children to a decent school. That would probably be a much more productive conversation, but I don't know that that is an appeal that can be made. I think the last administration tried that. I, I don't know that that's an appeal that can be made. So that book, um, Brown is the New White, just says, this is the reality that we have right now. Work with the political coalitions that you do have, and then perhaps put the idea of broadening that coalition on the list of priorities. But instead, what we do, right, is we have continual conversations about how can we prioritize white working class people. Yeah, and let me just say that you're, um, I'm not saying that we should prioritize white working class people over everybody else. I've never said that in the sure. past. I'll never say it in the future. And I don't even think of this as identity politics. I think of it as the distribution of social power and social honor. And I think we distribute social power and social honor very unequally. I think there's a hierarchy between men and women. I think there's a hierarchy among races. Um, and I think there's also a hierarchy based on class. Which is more important? Now that's a truly boring question. None of them should exist. I do not endorse any of them. What I'm looking for is what Cecilia is looking for, and I think what we're all looking for, is a way to bring fundamentally decent people together. Now, the alt-right came out for Trump. Are we going to welcome them into our coalition? No. We're not talking about those people. But there are a lot of fundamentally decent people who are right now, they are not being their better selves. And one of the reasons they're not being their better selves is because they feel that liberal feeling rules mandate empathy and compassion for a whole series of groups, but not them. And so insulting that whole series of groups that we all care about very deeply is a way of putting their thumb in the eye of the elite. And what we do when we do nothing in terms of, or very little or ineffective in terms of a positive message and obsessed with attacking Trump, what we do is marry these people to Trump even more deeply. That's what we did during the campaign. Why we're still doing it, that is beyond me. I'm Basil Scarless. I used to deal with international trade issues, but what, what strikes me here is what you said, uh, Ms. Williams, about Germany and the need to create universal programs. And of course, no pr program is universal unless it includes clearly the middle class, and they are critical in supporting changes, uh, introduction and support of such programs. Uh, some ideas I heard, and I think there are others, uh, access to daycare, sick leave, uh, perhaps even minimum vacation times. Uh, all of these, I wonder, is it possible, do you think, to convince broadly the, the American public uh, to accept these programs? These exist in Germany, uh, and there are many others as well. I mean, I think one, that's one of the Democrat. I mean, I speak as someone who is one of the very early work family people. I have worked for paid leave forever, my entire professional life. I think that one of the things, one of the miscues um, in the Democratic Party is that when we talk about, um, we talk about economic issues, we talk about, uh, you know, paid leave, minimum vacation. All of those things are super important if you have a job, if you have a benefited job. 95% of the jobs, someone at the AFL-CIO just told me yesterday, that have been created in the past 10 years are non-standard employment. Either they're not full-time or they're not benefited. Now, are white people angry about this? You bet they are. Are people of color angry about this? You bet they are. 
the African American middle class lost those jobs a generation before the white folks. Now, I get it, I get it that it only becomes an issue suddenly when the white folks, okay, I totally get that, I see it, I don't deny it, but it's an issue now. It's an issue that people of color care about, whether they're poor or middle class, just along with whites. Who asked, uh, we'll go right here. Thank you. Um, my name is Eleanor Starmer, and I worked on rural development issues uh, in the Obama administration at USDA for many years. Um, I'm also from a tiny town in New Hampshire in a region where the timber industry is tanking. Mm -hmm. And I want to ask your insights on rural America. And I say that recognizing, of course, it's not monolithic and you c it's hard to make generalizations, but I've been really in, um, I've been following the coverage since the election really closely and have been disturbed, um, you know, in part just because of how many stereotypes are being put forward, but also because I think in many ways the, the division between rural and urban just drives another wedge between rural working class people and others that doesn't need to be driven. On the other hand, coming from a rural place and working on these issues, I recognize that the challenges in rural places are very different, and a lot of times the policy prescriptions also need to be different. I'm wondering how you, in your work, have encountered distinctions or commonalities between rural and, and urban places, and kind of how you're thinking about, um, about those issues in general. Yeah. I mean, I think rural people are really important because, again, I'm not just focused on winning the presidency because I just looked at a man I admire more than anyone else that I've known in American politics and look how little he could accomplish with all of the brilliance that you see represented in this room because we couldn't carry the house. We need to address that ocean of red and a lot of the people in that ocean of red are rural people. I think there's a lot of similarities um, but I just promised my friend I wouldn't use this phrase, but I will, not on the record, Rust Belt, Rust Belt folks um, and in deindustrialized areas and rural areas, I think what they hold in common is that they feel that they've been forgotten um, and they feel that um, they don't really embrace the prescription of if you want a really robust economic future, get your act together, move to where the jobs are, and go to college. I think both of those groups of people find that very, very off-putting. They're deeply rooted. The deeply rooted of all non-elite people, um, whether, regardless of race, regardless of whether they're middle class or poor, um, the social networks are very small. They're clique networks. They're not like our broad, shallow entrepreneurial networks. Their identity and their economics depends on remaining within the clique networks. Why do African Americans remain in, middle ci in, in inner cities? It's not because of, as someone wrote me, the stubborn immobility of these people. What do you think? Trump can deliver jobs to their front door just like pizza? Note the disdain. No, it's because the people living in those dense networks, they have dense relationships. That's the only way they can get quality child care, it's the only way they can get quality elder care. That's why the African American ladies who are in inner cities remain there. It's safer there for them. It's the right economic decision. That doesn't mean there are jobs there, but that means that we have to deliver jobs to the networks that create the economic stability for people and frankly create the social meaning in their lives because their social honor stems from being understood as a good person in this small social network. I mean, I was just li living in the Netherlands, that, you know, what do you do? That upper middle class question. I'm a law professor, there's my honor. I tell in the book, and then I'll shut up, um, a, a story of going back to my husband's high school reunion when he, with a regrettable lack of code switching, although he grew up in this blue collar environment, um, asked a colleague, uh, asked a, not a colleague, a former classmate, what do you do? The guy said, I sell toilets. <laughs> well, if you sell toilets, you want to keep in a small group of people who don't judge you by your job, who know you're a good person, a person to be reckoned with. That's why middle class people and low income people, there's economic reasons why they want to remain where they are. They're also 
very important social and social honor reasons, and we need to respect that. They are not going to move to Berlin, folks. And I would just jump in, having spent a lot of time in rural communities, and my parents live in a very small town in eastern Iowa where they uh, run a weekly newspaper. Um, this is not anything that you don't already know, but rural towns are hurting right now, yeah, um, especially in the Midwest. Um, in a lot of red states, um, there have been a lot of tax incentive programs and tax cuts um, that have decreased the amount of tax revenue that these states are bringing in. Mm -hmm. um, in the state of Oklahoma, I was in a small town there for a while, there's just, there's no extra money for anything. Um, you know, senior centers are having to just scrape together donations because the county and the state aren't giving them money anymore. Um, you know, rural airports are, are suffering, grocery stores are closing. Uh, you know, I mean, it's kind of decades of, of state and local decisions have kind of set them up uh, to fail, especially if the one big employer in town moves somewhere else or, or does something that. differently. Yes, when you outsource the jobs, you lose the revenue is lost and communities collapse. And it's so important for me to understand that. And it's, it's something that the Trump administration needs to Keep in mind, um, the budget that they've put forward right now um, would really hurt a lot of rural communities, and um, they're really lobbying their lawmakers to, to change that. All right. The gentleman whose hand has been up for oh, a long time. Yes. Uh, I haven't read the book yet, but I, I'm wondering if you could just help me out a little bit. When someone says, uh, the, the candidate says, I w we want to make America great again. Tell, tell me what year or years was it great? Be be between the two of you, you were in the campaign and you, you wrote the book. What, what years? Help me out. Um, I think the way, that, the way I understand that is a couple of different ways. First of all, um, people, white working class people are much more patriotic, patriotic than um, the elites are. And one of the reasons are they are is that everybody tends to stress the social categories that give them honor. And, de and, and, and one of the social categories that gives this group honor is being Americans. And they're very, very proud of it. So I think that's part of why Amer Make America Great Again was very um, appealing. I also think they're thinking back to those two short generations after World War II when um, high school educated guys could get solid middle class standards of living. Now, for African Americans, that was, and I'm ex exaggerating, but that was roughly one generation, not two generations. Right after World War II and, the, and until, until the, set, well, right working class men started to slide in 73. I imagine African Americans started a generation before, right, right. Um, I think that's what they're looking back to. There are polls, there was a poll that came out in 2016, I think it was the Public Religion Research Institute, that polled people on this very question, like what is this sort of great period um, you know, that you're enamored of and wish that we could get back to, and the answer seemed to be roughly about 1950, 51, somewhere in there, and of course, yeah, even if they were not alive, and of course, for me, of course, what that immediately raised was, well, of course, this was a period when, I'll just use myself as an example, there would be no credit cards, no credit, no secured way to vote, in fact, I probably would not be able to vote, uh, segregated schools, segregated public facilities. This does not sound great to me. Now, however, in fairness, I do, and this is something I really do appreciate about your book, this idea that people find honor in different areas of their life and that people find, and therefore, this is where they assign value in sort of public spaces and public ideas. I have no doubt, especially because of some of the emails that I received after I wrote about that poll, that that people genuinely believe, that some people genuinely believe that the 1950s was just like a much more wholesome time and um, certainly also a, a time when there was greater economic prosperity for people with more limited education, so therefore it was a good time. But it still brings me back to the very first thing that I said, which is that also means 
that these are people who at minimum feel that the total exclusion of some people is just not that big of a concern. Like it's just, America was great then, and that's fine, because it was great for me, and that's it. Or if there, the, the phenomena that you describe, which are accurate, was not on their radar then, and probably not, and not something that they're thinking about now. I mean, I think of it as a response to the notion that everything's changing, because everything is changing, right? We're in this time of really enormous change, that the economy's changing, what work is like is changing, and demographically we're changing. And so it's a, li it's, it's a little bit code for, there's a lot going on that makes me uncomfortable, that's scary, and, and I don't like it, and I want it to stop. Um, and, and to me, that's part of what that expression indicates. I don't know that people are, are thinking through, yeah, this, like I remember that this was like a good time for my parents or my grandparents, and they were economically secure. They may not be taking the rest of the leap and remembering that their grandparents, African American neighbors, were not in the same situation. They're not, right? Or, or they're, you know, the African Americans on the other side of the tracks weren't doing nearly as well. It may be that they they may not be thinking that through, but it is an expression of of um, discomfort with uh, a lot of changed circumstances, including that people with names like mine and people who look like like Janelle are more visible and more present. And, and more vocal. I just have to say, I'm going to say a bit about that. I, in, in, in 1963, I got arrested trying to get a card at an all-white library in my home state. And I'll say it, Columbus, Georgia. And, and so things may have been great for white people in that city, but I was denied a card not because of any bad thing I'd done, just because of the color of my skin. I couldn't change that. I was born black. And, and so... This, if, if we're going to uh, cure this thing, we've got to have a dialogue, and it's got to work for everybody, not just some people. Yeah. I, something that is interesting that I think um, certainly exists, and there have been some proposals to this effect. They haven't gone anywhere, unfortunately. In the previous Congress, I guess we'll see what happens with this Congress, but there have been some proposals regarding um, that are more universal in nature in that they uh, sort of set a standard, I guess, sort of create economic opportunity zones, or this idea that can get dangerous because then you start to get into the issue of tax revenue and um, kind of giveaways, theoretically. However, um, that sort of aim to encourage business investment, the relocation of jobs to areas of the country where unemployment is highest, where needs are greatest, and the truth is those two areas, generally speaking, the areas that tend to fall within sort of these criteria are urban areas and rural areas, right? Sort of the polar opposite of one another in many ways, I guess in the sort of mind's eye and the public imagination, but they share a lot in common in terms of their economic situation. What you were describing in terms of what's happening in rural America has been the condition of many urban areas since roughly 1973. Right? I mean, there are entire, there are many, many books, but when work disappears, was written about this very phenomenon, right? So, you know. All right, and I hate to, to cut this off, but I'm getting the, the stop sign. Um, <laughs> that we've hit the end of our time. Um, so, but thank you guys all for this wonderful conversation and for all these wonderful questions. It's really interesting. Thank you.